I know I do, and lots of other people do so. And while Darcy's mum, Kaylee, thinks her daughter is better off being in school to start her GCSE studies, she can't help but worry. I'm happy for her to return, but I am also worried because obviously with everything that's gone on, I kept the safe for home for so long, you know, in our little family bubble. And now she's like returning properly. I am worried obviously about the bias breaking out and numbers increasing. But such worries are completely natural. That's according to psychologist Callum Davis, who says the key to coping with the return to school is patience and reassurance. What very often happens is you feel uncomfortable you think, oh my God, they don't feel like this. And then if parents feel, oh my God, it's a problem. Then it just gets much, much worse. Whereas if it's viewed as, well, actually, this is a normal experience. It's perfectly okay. You don't have to solve it. Uh, actually, the, the suffering experience is far, far less. So for Darcy and thousands like her, it's a big step forward towards what she hopes will be a normal school year. Sean Jenkins, ITV News. Thing with the coronavirus. Today's figures show that there are currently 408 people in hospital with COVID in Wales. That's more than double the number just a month ago. And those increasing numbers are once again having an impact. The virus has forced the closure of three wards to visitors at the Royal Glamorgan Hospital in Clantrisons and the suspension of some elective orthopaedic surgery at Prince Philip Hospital in Clinetley and Willie Bush Hospital in Hampton West. Earlier, I spoke with Dr. Raja Bidwak from the Kintar's Morganol Health Board and began by asking him to describe the pressure that his team is under. The staff are psychologically, psychologically, physically tired from the constant sort of uh, cases of COVID that we have been dealing with. And uh, unfortunately, uh, due to uh, this reason, a lot of the elective uh, operations at Okay, <clears throat> let me uh, let me turn the camera around so we're not reflecting too much light. Uh, do do do. Oh, hi, Jack. First one on. <laughs> um, oh, we, yeah. I think there's uh, we've got about ten people on at the moment. Um, I'm just trying to get the light if I can, because uh, the light's glared in a bit. <clears throat> Mm, a bit better. I don't know. Um, okay. Right, bit of a rush tonight. <laughs> Has a couple of things I want to cover tonight, and uh, hopefully, if any questions, uh, I'll try to answer them if I can. Um, okay. Right, I got a couple of things. Uh, there's a few people coming on board. Just give it a minute or two. I said five past. It's six minutes past now. Um, just going to ask a question. Alexa, what's the weather like in Reading? In Reading, England, it's 18 degrees Celsius with partly sunny skies. Tonight, you can expect just a few clouds in the sky with a low of 11 degrees. Okay. Alexa, what's the fishing going to be like tomorrow? Sorry, I'm not sure. <laughs> She's not sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're never sure, are we, really? We're never sure what the weather's going to be like. Uh, sorry, what the fish is going to be like, I should say. But um, I think it's all down to, um, obviously, a bit of prepping as well. You know, you make your own luck in life, don't you? Um, the more you practice, the luckier you become. That's uh, a famous saying. <laughs> right. Um, I've just, um, just cleaned my reels, actually, because... Uh, I, you know, I've been doing a lot of fishing lately, and uh, the reels are getting a bit clogged up, ground bait. I've got to put some line on two of the reels. But uh, anyway, um, right, okay, where are we going to start? Right, I'm going to start off by saying uh, um, greetings and welcome. Welcome to uh, this question and answer um, forum. As I say, it's the first one last week, second one this week. 
hopefully if it grows, um, you know, we'll do more and uh, we'll try and keep it going. Now, uh, last week, I think uh, fr last Friday, I mentioned I'll be fishing the, the Evesham on the Sunday. Now, unfortunately, I didn't qualify for the Saturday, even though I tried my best. <laughs> uh, and there's a few anglers, uh, uh, good, you know, quite good anglers who didn't qualify for the Saturday. Um, but they did the Sunday and I qualified for the Sunday. Um, and having a little bit of indifferent um, results on the Warwick Raven uh, at Evesham, um, when I drew my peg, uh, to peg 23, it wasn't the best peg. It, it was one that, you know, you wouldn't run to thinking, oh, you're going to get in the frame or anything. Yeah, maybe a possible uh, sexual win or something, you know. Um, I think I remember Skinner catching a bag off it once and he got in the frame. Anyway, um, I drew 23. Now, uh, if any of the regulars know, the 24, peg 24, is obviously a better peg. That's that's by the bridge, because um, I had that in um, uh, in one of the matches. And uh, one of my friends, uh, Ken Orsi, he qualified off that peg. So we know he's got a bit of form. Well, anyway, um, the peg below 24, which is by the culvert, again, is a peg that um, got a bit of uh, form to it. In fact, I drew it. A couple of weeks ago and had a good weight at eight pound off it thinking oh you know I, I, I get something with that but i didn't even it was a day that it, it fished exceptionally well and i didn't um you know i didn't uh, uh i didn't even get a section for that um i think uh was it jim broccoli uh won the section but anyway as i said that was um it was it was a, a good peg and i knew uh, oh of course the day before jamie robbins had it and he won a section off it for four pounds something so I thought, well, I got my work cut out. And um, anyway, now, as it happens, so I'm going to tell you something now, because obviously the series is over. But as the last four or five matches, you notice I was very close to framing on a few of them. I was third in one match, and I won my section on the other two. And I started to learn that these fish, uh, because of the lack of oxygen in the water, they were coming up in the water, and they weren't staying on the bottom. Obviously, it's probably more oxygen on the top surface. Anyway, I was drip feeding um, maggots. And, you know, I was um, I was catching perch and roach. Not often, but every sort of time, 10 minutes, you get one. And, of course, over a, over a, um, a match, it would soon build up. And uh, anyway, um, I, so I adopted the same principle on, on, the, uh, on that match, the Evesham final. And... Um, I had a pretty good weight, well, for the day, and we four pound ten. I didn't think it it win anything in particular, um, you know, because obviously, uh, but I knew it'd been fishing hard. Anyway, uh, they of all things, um, they when they come to weigh in, they weighed in from the bottom pegs, you know, peg eighty eight on the way up instead of normal peg one and down. So I did wait quite a long time, and I, I know one of the subscribers. Uh, said uh, uh, that I'd been drinking whiskey or something, but <laughs> I can assure you I wasn't. Uh, but anyway, what happened? Um, uh, we waited, and uh, by the time they got to me, lo and behold, I was told by Colin Perry, he said, uh, and I weighed in four pound ten. He said, That's the second best weight from all the way down. And I thought, Wow. And anyway, I thought, Well, who, who, who's got what above me? And of course, above me, Jane, Jamie had nine pound. Uh, well, it's a bit of that's a bone of contention that as well. I don't know if everyone knows the story about that, but I will briefly talk about that one because I think uh, there's a little bit of uh, injustice went on. But anyway, um, anyway, lo and behold, uh, as far as I knew, there was two weights better than me, and those uh, that was the Babel on eighty six and Jamie. And lo and behold, I didn't realise that uh, somebody said that uh, Tom Scully on peg seventy five, the peg that I. Uh, won the section off the week previously, which is a good peg where it shallows up a bit. He had uh, four pound eleven. He dumped me by one ounce. <laughs> now, who would believe one ounce made the difference of seven hundred and fifty quid? Um, so you know, <laughs> so I come in port, so I'm not complaining. I still picked up seven hundred and fifty quid. Um, here's my check. Yeah. So anyway, so as I said. On my vlog about where stays. So yeah, 750 quid was a nice little pickup. But the difference between one ounce was fifteen hundred quid. That's one thousand five hundred and a trophy. So anyway, good luck to Tom. I mean, you know, obviously it's one of the things. Now coming back to, coming back to Jamie. Now 
it's an awkward situation because, you know, the, the scalesman got a lot on his shoulders when he weighs in sometimes, especially in big events like that. And what happened on that particular day is that he um, he, he weighed the uh, very early in peg 86, he weighed a barbell, which I believe went, um, what to go now, it, it, well, and, and some bits. And, of course, when he weighed him, uh, like you would, you just weighed, wouldn't you, normally? Anyway, as... as as he went all the way through the uh, uh, the field, and when he got to Jamie, but the weights were very, very close. Now the trouble is with digital scales; um, they're very, they're so accurate that any drop of water in the net, it'll register a weight. Now, if anyone saw the blog of Cadence when they made it, um, uh, his fish went on the net. Jamie's fish went on on the net, and it weighed in thirteen pound, um, I think, uh, one one ounce or something like that. Well, of course, um, the barbell, I believe, went 13 pound. And um, so he had to be dead accurate on the on the scales now, because obviously you don't want a joint uh, decision because there's only one cut to go around. <laughs> so anyway, as it happened, he waited and he waited and as it, the water drained. Um, obviously, the, the weight went less and less and ended up, well, the, uh, Jamie lost by four drams. No, four drams is like a, a mouthful of bloody coffee. <laughs> So it's very unlucky for Jamie, but he is, let's say, Jamie on, uh, uh, you know, uh, that upset the bully because uh, he's a great angler anyway. And um, But overall, it was a good match, and, you know, I was happy that I was there and I was in the final. Okay, uh, I've got a couple of questions coming through. Big match at uh, Hayfield Lakes tomorrow, and your mate, uh, uh, Alan, is five times champion. In it. Oh, okay, Alan Scott on, is he? Okay. Yeah, well, Alan's one of them anglers that can put his hands to both, you know, and do commercials as well as, um, you know, natural fishing, which uh, is great, you know. So I wish him well. Right, Anthony Rose. Oh, apart from um, the fishing side, which is hard, what do you think about the whole festival? Um, you had a lot of people uh, complain about the lack of tackle companies and stands. Well, yes, Anthony, um, it's unfortunate that, of course, it's not sponsored these days, that event. Uh, when it was sponsored and it was uh, promoted quite a lot by um, Matt Fishing and uh, the Angling Times and, and so forth, of course, there was more money in it and it probably attracted more people. But uh, I've got to admit, even myself, I've noticed over the years, uh, we don't get as many uh, visitors now, perhaps not so many anglers, I don't know. And perhaps we don't, um, you know, it doesn't uh, attract this, you know, uh, the amount of sponsors or the anglers or, or visitors that, that's required. Now, I don't know the politics side of it. I don't know how much it costs to, to get a tent and uh, or to put a stand up. But I suppose at the end of the day, you know, um, you've got to work out how much it's costing, what you're going to get back in return and so on. So, yes, um, yeah, it's uh, it has gone down a bit. Uh, Mal, uh, or oh, Matt, Matt, hi, hi Matt. Um Right, Anthony, I've got another question for you because you asked me the question. Um, i got a little note here. Uh, to do. Right, you asked about a, the disgorger on one of my vlogs. Now, um, I think my last vlog where I was catching perch. Now, I don't know if you're aware, but perch, um, they got quite a big um, suction. You know, when they suck the bait in, I've actually seen a worm travel, you know, four or five inches you know, into a perch's mouth, you know, uh, while it was sucking, you know, for the bait. I've seen it in aquariums. So I know they got a tremendous suck. And now that the other thing with perch, of course, is that they haven't got the um, uh, frangal teeth that roach have and chub. They don't mash the, uh, the the bait, the maggot. They actually suck it whole right down the gullet. And that's why if you ever catch perch, a lot of you will know, it's always down the throat. Now, I'm going to go back now. 30 odd years ago when we were in the world championships and um, the continental teams, you know, we got very friendly with them. And on one particular occasion, they come up with this, um, we get like a goodies bag, you know, before the present, before the match, uh, evening before the match. Anyway, on this one occasion, um, we're going through these bits and pieces. They come out with, with something like this. Now, we wondered what the hell that was, because if you look at it, it's just got like a, a hole in the top with a little groove. And we were thinking, well, what the hell do you use that for? You know, is it knitting or crochet? 
you know, perhaps he got it mixed up with some other uh, festival going on. But no, we were told this is a disgorger. It's a, it's a, uh, they call it the slammer, uh, and it's a deep, uh, th- uh, it's a deep throated disgorger. In other words, you can disgorge a hook out of a, a bream, you know, because bream in them days used to suck it down there and then use small hooks. Um, eels and perch in particular, because it's a marvelous tool. Because all you do, you get the line and you actually just put it into the little groove uh, on the top and you push it down to the bend of the hook. And like a disgorge, just like push and pull and out it comes. And they're tremendously. And any angler who hasn't got one of these should get one because, um, as well as a, a, a traditional disgorger, these are brilliant. Not only does it save you time, it saves the fish from uh, stress or killing the fish, and you get your hook back. All right, so I would strongly recommend um, uh, Anthony, and it is um, what we call a slammer disgorger. Um, I, I was selling them, I've run out now, unfortunately. This is probably the last one. Um, they're about a pound or so each, I think, but they're definitely worth having one in your box. Okay, and yeah, so I thought I'd answer that question to you. Uh, Stephen, hi Stephen, evening, how are you? Uh, have you ever caught uh, on elvries and have you um, over hemp uh, in count uh, in tears? Right, I know so it's a real weird thing that I, I remember once on the Bristol Avon, uh, fishing a match on the Bristol Avon. Anyway, talking about Bristol Avon, I'll be fishing that this Sunday, by the way. I haven't fished for a long time since the River Best. But anyway, fishing at Newbridge, exactly where I'm going. One of the anglers, I, never, I hadn't seen this before, and they, they actually put in elderberries. They took it off the bush and they were putting it on the hook and catching roach. Now, I'd never particularly used it because it's a match angler. You, you, you don't experiment until you practice. And sometimes even when you practice on your own, you catch where you won't in a match. So the simple answer to that, uh, Stephen, no, I don't use it, but I have seen it, and I have seen it being used. And I'm sure it would work in, in matches when, you, you know, you, you got fish going uh, on the hemp, and, you, and uh, you know, we use tears, as you say. And uh, um, another alternative then is, is the elderberry, because it's a small black berry, very soft, and you can hook it quite easily. Um, but I, I would imagine they will probably come off easy as well if you strike. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Stephanie, which comes back uh, comes to a, a, a memory of mine as a youngster. We used to, I used to catch roach on the river taff with silkweed. Now I don't know if any lads have ever, ever fished silkweed or caught fish on silkweed, but that was a magical bait. Um, you know, we used to go on the weir. Uh, we used to take the strands of it and just wrap it round a hook, and we used to catch loads and loads of roach. And I actually, as a youngster, won the Welsh national uh, championships using that as bait. At four pound odd, I remember now, and I and I won a trophy. So yeah, you know, unusual baits sometimes do work, but uh, as a modern day match angler, we 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 don't experience perhaps not as much as we should. So anyway, okay, <laughs> um, Anthony, yes, uh, David, uh, do you think the stick float is starting to make a comeback? Do you know what? If you watch my vlogs, you you know that that's what I do. I'm an old natural angler. I love the stick float. I like the waggler. And I went through the pole uh, phase. In fact, I'm going to tell you a story because when the, when we um, when we started first using the pole 30 odd years ago, it was brand new to the uh, uh, the British market. And um, and funny enough, Chris Taylor, who I hadn't seen for many many years, came to the uh, Eusha match on Sunday, and I met up with him and shook his hand. And because we'd done a feature together, and that was on the Avon, and I fished the pole, and he fished the waggler. Well, in them days, he was the Kitty, he was the boy to beat. He, you know, he was writing articles and that. And we both worked for Aiken Fishing Tackle. Anyway, we done this feature for the Angler magazine. I fished a pole, he fished a waggler, and I beat him. And I said, one day, poles will be uh, poles uh, win a match on the on the Wallace Raven. Well, what another statement, eh? You know, I, I think that not a, uh, not a week goes by the match, not one other pole these days. But it just goes to show you don't know how we develop. And yes, I hope the stick float does make a comeback because, you know, I like to fish a stick a float because it gives you uh, more of a swim to fish with, you know, because with a pole, you're generally limited, if you like, to the um, to the uh, to the length of the pole, the length of the line. You know, you sometimes you only fish half your swim, but with a stick float, you can go all the way down. And uh, I, I, if you go to my website, uh, the Gold Medal Floats, you see I, I, be, I developed a stick float with a bristle in it, ideal for like hemp fishing and that sort of thing. And uh, anyway... Yeah, I hope the stick float does make a comeback, and I'd like to see more people use it. 
Uh, who else we got? Uh, that was um, uh, like, uh, cheers a bit. All right. Okay. Anthony, uh, Andrew, uh, with all the years of fishing, um, dead. Oh, sorry, my eyes are going a bit here. <laughs> uh, with all the years of fishing, what keeps you competing uh, instead of just going out and then? Do you know, it's a good question, that. Um, I, I went through the phase uh, many years ago, you know, winning the world championships and, and uh, you know, uh, if you like, reaching the, the, um, the climax of your life, you know. And after that, I can understand why, you know, maybe people like, I don't know, Ian Heaps, Dave Roper, Thomas, and all these former world champions, they, they just stopped going fishing because I think once you reach um, your goals in life sometimes, you think, what else is there? And I did go through a little phase like that, but I, you know, I come out of it. <laughs> I come out of it. I started going fishing again, and uh, and I just love the competitive. You know, obviously, it's hard to compete these days. You know, as you get older, I'm 70 now, by the way, which is, uh, you know, who would have thought that 35 years when I uh, when I was won the World Championships, I was 35 years old. All them years ago, you know, it's gone so quickly when I think about it. And, um, yeah, I've... Um, I I love my fishing I, and I'm fishing three or four times a week and um, I've actually got another job a spare time job uh, to help um, finance it and it's nothing to do with the tackle industry it's a, a retail shop um, but yes uh, yeah, it'd be great if I could make money in fishing but unfortunately a lot of people know that um, being Welsh has its uh, kickbacks um, being English, of course, I would have probably could have made a living out of it like a lot of other anglers. But, you know, hey, I enjoy it. I do. That's why I, if you ever notice, I'm, uh, the only company I'm sponsored by is Census. And I only do that uh, because of the lads, the, my team gives them uh, some sponsorship for ground bait and that. But if you look, I, I'm not um, al uh, aligned to any tackle company or any, um, uh, you know, any uh, fishing products, really. Um I use what I think is uh, I'm happy with, and and I just go along. So when I give a view, sometimes it's you know it's not uh, biased. It's it's um, it's an honest truth. So uh, yeah. Um, anyway, I'm going off on a tangent then. <laughs> but thanks for that question. That was great. Um, right, uh, Neil, uh, where's the next uh, float only on the seven? All oh, right, that's in two weeks' time. Two weeks' time. As you know, um, if you see my blog this week. Um, uh, I uh, I drew peg 81 on winter dine, not a particularly good area as far as I was aware. Uh, in fact, if you saw my vlog, I'd, I'd tell you about what happened with uh, uh, the year before when I was drawing down there all the time. But I still made the top 10, which, uh, and to get in the top 10 in the float only league against all those top anglers is, uh, in my eyes, I think it was a, a, you know, a good feat. And this year, unfortunately, things have gone a little bit against me and... Uh, um, you know, maybe that was on my mind. But anyway, I just fished my match and had a lovely day's fishing. £13.10, uh, which would normally get in the frame or even win a section. But I was just out of it. I was 11th, you know, which is unfortunate. But, um, yeah, so two weeks' time. Um, I just looked at the points. I just worked out all the points uh, system as well. And uh, even if I won it, I don't think I'm going to make the top 10. Um, and, that's the, and that's, of course, the... Um, the 19 people have had me come lower than me, which I can't see that happening, you know. But um, anyway, but thanks for asking. That's in two weeks' time, so I will be doing a blog on that one. Um, uh, let's have a look. Andrew Smith. Hi, Clive. Uh, what's your favourite venue and your favourite method? Well, <clears throat> funny enough, um, i done a coaching day yesterday. I've uh, just put the blog up, now if you haven't seen it, with a chap named Ian Hardy who uh, from Kent. And he, he's been going to the Y now for a couple of years, and uh, he asked me the same question. Um, I suppose my favourite venue is where you're going to catch fish, you know, because I, I think that, um, you know, I got so many favourites. I would say the Y, because obviously I was brought up on the Y, and uh, it's wild and water. We, we, we only fish it um, uh, a couple of months in the year, and uh, and it's full of fish. We do catch a lot of fish, but I, I like the Welsh Raven. I like the Bristol Raven when I'm going Sunday. That's another one. Um, you know, uh, if I, uh, I think I was actually asked the same question last week. If I went to heaven, I would, uh, what water would I like to fish? And that would be, um, well, the old river taff, as it used to be 20, 30 years ago, full of roach and coal dust. <laughs> that was a great river. But this day you go over there, you will catch fish. Um, 
there's uh, a few there's a few roach to be caught a couple of days uh, the one thing that the the, the water authority um a couple of years ago put some barbel in now unfortunately the barbel never uh, haven't bred by the look of it but those barbel they put in with two or three pound each now can be caught and they're, they're averaging like 20 pound they're massive things you know i mean uh, one of the the lads now he's had a couple of 18 pounders of it, you know, but they go in the night to catch them. And, uh, you, you know, I don't think you catch them in the daytime, but, uh, you know, anyway, that's, uh, that was my favorite uh, years ago. My favorite now is probably the why I expect, you know. Um, right, Stephen. Uh, I have good bags of roach and, uh, and on, on, okay, on wheat, on the seven at Holt Fleet. That's interesting, yeah. Uh, the only time I've ever seen fish caught on wheat um, was on the Gloucester Canal of all places many years ago, um, you know. But um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, there is a lot of baits, as you say, you know, that we probably neglect, and the fish don't even know what they are half the time. I think, you know, when when we're match fishing, we stick to the tried and tested baits, don't we? You know, maggots, casters, worms, uh, uh, um, pellets are coming a lot into it now. I mean, even catching roach on pellets on the seven, you know. So, okay. Um, Right, uh, Tom's right. Does bread punch work well on the feeder? Well, you know, um, a couple of years ago, that was a method, I talked about the Gloucester Canal. They start off on a cage feeder with, um, you know, a bread punch, and uh, they'd always have a few. Um, so, yeah, it, it is a method that does work, um, especially on hard days. Um, I, if you watch my blog, I tried it a couple of times uh, on the Avon just to get the, um, just get some bait down, and um, yeah. I think where else did they work? I used to work on, I remember Phil Davis from the North Lads telling me that I think they were fishing on the Weaver or on the D and they were catching on it. But, you know, I can't uh, remember a lot about that now. So going back a few years. Um, okay, uh, Stephen Collins, uh, why do you think that there's so many pike in the rivers and canals more than previous years? You know what? I wish I had the answer to that, Thomas. I really do because, you know, <clears throat> it's been a bane of my life lately. Um, I know, you know, somebody said, well, how come I seem to get a lot of pike in my swims? Well, you know, to be honest with you, um, I, I, my own personal feeling is that when I fish, you know, I start, I attract a lot of small fish into my swim because the way I feed and, and so on, um, you know, I feed often and, and regular and, and I, I accumulate a lot of fish in the swims generally. And what happens? I think the pike just see it, they follow it. And then I end up getting piked out. And I think that is a problem, you know, because when I think back uh, on times that, um, you know, uh, that you don't feed regular, like if you feed a fish in or, or you just, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, fish in a, uh, a swim where you don't put a lot of feed in, you don't get pike. You know, it's only when you get a lot of fish in your swim, you get pike. Now, the reason why there are pike, I think it's because the waters have been very, very low over the last month or two um you know and the, the pike you don't catch so many pike wet when you get color in the water you can do of course but not so much i think that when it's clear the pike can see it because pike are um are very visual uh, they they attack their, their their you know they feed when they, they uh they, by visual as well as um vibrations of the fish being stressed in the water and i think it's because the the water's been low and clear i think the the pike are becoming a bit more uh, dominant and um, well there's certainly uh, I don't know where there's been a pike explosion probably all over the country but uh, it seems to be pike everywhere at the moment now which is a shame really because um, it, it's you know it's cost me money it's cost me the last five or six matches I fished you know I wish I had the answer I mean I, I even put a um, one of the boys at Evesham uh, Lee Gardner he showed me um, you know um, lower you know, to, and try and catch a fish out, to, you know, try and get the pike out the swim. But I tried that. They don't want to know a lower. <laughs> so they only like live fish for some reason. Oh, uh, anyway. Okay. Um, I don't know the answer. You know, as I said, I got my theories. Everyone got theories on things, I suppose, you know. Uh, right. Uh, Stuart. Uh, John Wilson was a great inspiration for me. How well did you know him? Well, you know, John Wilson sort of come on the scene uh about the time i won the world championships and you know um i i can tell you uh, the story behind john um he had a tackle shop in norfolk and uh, i remember 
I think it was um, the BBC or, or it was uh, one of the television programs, I'm not sure which one, uh, was doing a, a wildlife um, program and they, they went into John's shop and for some waders apparently. And uh, anyway, John, being a good talker, salesman, he told me, so why do you make a fishing one? <laughs> and I think that's how it all um, started uh, for John. And um, I never really got to know him uh, in a sense. I told you last week I met him on the um, on the uh, Hampshire Raven where the, uh, the film crew, his film crew borrowed the chub off me to rehook it, to make out he caught it, you know, but uh, <laughs> that's another story. Um, but uh, I, I didn't really know him, but um, he was a great ambassador for fishing and he obviously inspired a lot of people and brought them on to fishing, which was great, you know, God rest his soul. And he, he, you know, he, uh, he passed away in Thailand um, when I was over there uh, the other year. Um, I, and I, one of my plans was to go down and actually see him and meet him um, living in Thailand. So anyway, okay. Uh, Neil, uh, are you fishing any waters, uh, any any winter leagues this year? Yes, I'll be fishing the uh, the Y Winter League. Um, that's a great league. Um, as long as the water, as long as we don't have too much water and, and uh, it gets flooded, because uh, most uh, years uh, it gets a bit high sometimes and uh, unfishable. Um, years ago, we'd fish it under any conditions. We used to we used to fish it even when it it, it was above the um, the bank and on the path, you know, and in the fields we used to fish it. But of course, health and safety these days uh, they probably wouldn't allow it, and uh, so sometimes we can't um, always finish the league off or. Or we have to use alternative dates and so on. So, but yes, I'll be fishing that. No, talking about leagues, I'm actually um, guesting for a team on Sunday. Uh, Chaplain Kevin Dix, uh, an angler from Bristol, you might know him, Kevin. He phoned me up the other day, wanted to know um, would I like to fish on um, Sunday on the Bristol Avon at Newbridge. And uh, I love that venue. No, I was booked in to go to Port Talbot. Uh, but I thought, no, um, I can fish Port Talbot anytime. You know, it's not often you. You get asked, and you know what? This is actually going against um, uh, one of my principles because I haven't fished for any other club but Cardiff Nomads for over 30 odd years. So this time I'll be fishing for another team. And Cardiff Nomads have got a team in it run by um, uh, Zidian, uh, who runs the, uh, the, the, the Bristol side of it. They call it Census Nomads, not Cardiff Nomads, they call it Census Nomads. Uh, so I'll be fishing against them. So yeah. so I'm looking forward to that. Um, so that's that's a league. That's called the Commercial House League. So yeah, but um, I won't be fishing all of them. Just that once. So yeah. So the Y is the only one I'll be fishing. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, Andrew Paul. Yeah, Andrew. Uh, thanks. I hope to again soon. Yeah. Okay, Paul. Thanks. Um, right, Stephen Cubs. Have you thought about? Uh, put in chopped fish like mackerel, etc., in the peg away from where you're feeding to take the pike away from your feeding area. Now, that's an interesting one. Yeah, that is an interesting one. Would that work? Hmm. As I said, I think pike are more visual than the smell and the attraction, the attractor, you know what I mean? Um, I think they, they tend to go for vibrations and, and uh, fishing in distress. Um, Maybe, you know, maybe that's something we could try. I don't know. if you if you tried it, Stephen? You know, if so, let me know. Anyway, coming back to uh, um, uh, last week. So, as I said, I fished the, um, the float only on the Wednesday. And then yesterday I'd done a, uh, um, you know, uh, coaching with Ian and his lad. And we, we had a nice day fishing. You haven't seen the vlog. Have a look at it. It's, uh, it was good. Um, yeah, Ian had right. Uh, right. I was at Evesham last week. Uh, I, you may have seen on the vlog, I bumped into Brian, um, uh, uh Bennett, and um, uh, Brian, he wrote that book, you know. In fact, let me, let me just get it for you. Uh, I'm going, to, I'm going to give him a plug and um, 
I was doing a review on this, by the way, which I never got around to finishing. Um, and I, when I uh, bumped into Brian, I said, it's a great book and he's getting some great reviews on it. Um, but if you, it's got a big book. It's almost like a telephone sort of book, you know. But the, I said that Brian, the only trouble is, Brian, he only writes in, a, in less than a third of the book. You know, that much about him and the rest about other anglers, you know, which is great. Okay, you know, all the other anglers have put their stories and about, you know, how they've done well and how they know Brian, etc. But like I said to Brian, I said, I would have liked to read, read a book just about him, really. I mean, the other guys, you know, I, yeah, don't get me wrong, some good, you know, really good anglers in there have written articles to help him, uh, you know, plump the book up, so to speak. But I, I said to Brian, I said, look, next time, try and write a book just about yourself and your exploits and what you've done. Because uh, that was the reason I bought the book. Or, or, in fact, I didn't buy it. He gave it to me. But uh, if I was going to buy it, that's the reason. But anyway, it's still a good read. I mean, there's some really top anglers in there. Uh, they've um, uh, and they've you know written about uh, um, lots of, you know uh, little stories about themselves. And you know it's interesting. You know a lot of things I didn't know before. Um, but yeah, so a little plug for Brian: um, a lifetime of match fishing by Brian Bennett. <laughs> Okay, coming back to Evesham, uh, any more questions? Um, right. Coming back to Evesham, I bumped into a chap. Uh, well, he was watching me fishing, and um, his name is Harold Patterson. Now, I don't know if you can see that. But he wrote this article about flat fishing, you know, flat floats. Or lollipops. Now, maybe I, I, I hadn't heard of him before, but uh, I think he he was saying that he was probably the first ones to, to, to make a flat float, you know, um, which is interesting. I mean, he's a really nice guy, you know, and he, he gave me this package, and it wasn't until tonight I, I really had a look at it. And inside, he's given me all these posters, you know, Jesus loves you. Um, Jesus, hang on. Jesus said, now I will make you fishers of men. You know. Um, you know no, I'm not a religious person, you know, but I, I take my head off to people who have religion, you know. You know, people who, who basically like to... Um, to believe in uh, in something that's great, you know. I don't I don't knock it at all, you know. I'm I'm a uh, my, my uh, wife uh, in Thailand. She's a Buddhist, and she, they believe in reincarnation, you know. And that's great if you've got a if you've got a um, you know a belief in something. But I don't like people pushing it on you. You know what I mean? But he's he's a nice guy. Don't, you know, don't get me wrong. He's um he's also give me a program. Um, you give me a couple of uh, fixtures of fiction matches coming up. And he's actually give me a uh, take me home a, a male voice choir uh, CD. So that was nice of him. So, yeah. So anyway, give him a shout. And uh, if he was the first to make uh, the, 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 the uh, lollipop float, then uh, I'd take my hat off to him. I mean, we made a very similar float years ago, uh, a friend of mine, Clive Roberts, uh, we call it the bat float, and it, it, um, it, it was more like a triangle flat float, uh, and it, it, um, the way it was shaped, it would hold back in the water. Um, the first float I have seen made like that was uh, a chap named um, uh, Ted, oh, I can't think of his last name, no. Um, and he was a Cardiff Nomad uh, member many, many years ago. And Ted uh, used to make these big rudder floats, like fl like uh, a flat float, but like a rudder shape. But they, they um, he used them, um, you know, for chub fishing. And they were huge things. And you'd, you'd be able to cast them out to the middle of the river and hold them against the current. And they would so hold it back. And they were good. But we didn't use them because the poles were on the wrong then. So we didn't uh, ever assume that they would be any good for a pole. But... Obviously, they are. You know, you can hold a hold a, a flat float um, against the um, the current and hold it still. So, um, 
Yeah, right, okay. Uh, what's this, Neil? Uh, uh, oh, what's this? Uh, sorry, before Neil, uh, Stephen. Uh, Try chop fish in a feed of a chub and caught Jack Pike. Oh, yeah. Oh, that, there you are. That goes to show you then, doesn't it? Maybe the smell. I know Xander uh, can hold me on, on the smell of fish. Yeah. Well, when you think about it, you know, a lot of the fish ground bait we use these days, and that attracts all type of fish, doesn't it? You know, because they, they are, you know, fish, I suppose, they are cannibals in a way. They will eat their own, you know, and, and the smell of the um, fish meal, which is a, a very strong amino acid, you know, that brings on the flavors. Uh, there. Yeah, yeah, I suppose that would work. Um, okay, Neil, uh, remember when I was a youngster years ago, there used to be um, a cracking roach and big chub at Evesham. Um, when we went on holiday to rent a can of pan. Oh, you know, you're, you're right, because uh, I go back 30-odd um, years when I used to fish Evesham, and there was a lot more fish in the rivers then, and there were bigger chub, there were chub, you know, um, all the way through. Whether over the years, whether it's the predation of, um, you know, predators, you know, everything from mink, which I've seen there, um, you know, Xander's pike. Um, I, I don't see cormorants there, but, you know, they might get goose sanders. No, goose sanders, they're, they're the worst because they eat the fry. They eat the small fry, so they never get a chance to grow up. I know they had a big problem on the Y with goose sanders. And um, one of the lads uh, from Hereford was going to, every morning, going along the bank with them with one of these uh, pens, you know, these uh, uh, lights, lights. Um, uh, ultraviolet lights and shining them and they'd spook them and off they go so you know that's a, a one way of not killing them at least you know and it's legal to do that i suppose yeah so yes uh, i can remember that but they're not you know you, you get pockets of them don't you you know you get pockets of them here there and, and everywhere like yeah anyway uh let's go back let's get right back to um right um i want to give a little plug uh to cadence because uh, i had this real uh, given to me by Jamie um, on the standard Evesham. And this particular reel, uh, I, I, I was very impressed with it because when I put the line on it, now I don't know if anyone ever uh, notices when they put line on the reel, how um, the line on the spool starts to uh, uh, go like a cone shape. Well, that tells me that the oscillating uh, uh, side of it doesn't actually... Uh, lay the line on the spool correctly. But this, when I put the real, uh, line on this, it did. Look at that. Perfect. So anyway, but not only that, it's a lovely reel. Um, you know, to me, a, a reel is a reel, an open-faced reel. Um, good for, like, you know, heavy type of fishing and nedgering. But you cannot beat, as far as I'm concerned, a close face reel. And if you've seen on my blogs, you see I use a lot of these. Um, you know, 501, 506s, 507s, um, this Abogashi one, very good. Oh, uh, of course, the reason I like these, of course, is easy, you know, bail and pick up, you know. <laughs> that one got stuck then, but yeah. So basically, you know, you can click the, the button, the line will go to your finger, and you cast. Quick retrieve and it picks it up. Now I noticed with Ian yesterday when I was uh, coaching, he was using an open face reel, and he um I had to show him really how to use it correctly because um what you have to do when you uh, fish with a chub, for example, a big fish, when you hook a fish, you use the uh, obviously you press against uh, with your finger against the spool to hold the line, and as you do, you feel the pressure of the line. Now, the, the, the problem a lot of people get is that when they pick the bail armor like this, right, sometimes it's a bit slow and it releases the line. The line becomes slack. And uh, Ian was doing that and he was a uh, few fish were coming off. So I showed him that basically what I do when I strike, hook the fish, and as I'm keeping the pressure on it, I use my left hand to close it. And I'm still keeping pressure on the line without. Uh, it becoming slack, so so the fish don't bounce off the hook, um, and that's a technique that you, you know that I, I taught him, and and afterwards he was doing quite well with it. But um, that that is the problem, as as I say, using open face reels um, is the fact that you've got to use your two hands, or or if you you know sort of try to pick the bail arm up, you've got that little moment when the, the line becomes a bit slack, you know. 
So um, anyway, uh, just I thought I'd just mention that because, uh, as I said, um, you can't beat, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, of course, you can't use um, big chub type of fishing on, on these reels because uh, they, they just won't cope with them. But the idea for the roach and dace and, and perch and, and so on. So there, that's my little preference with the reels. Um, okay. Do, do. Right. As I said, this weekend, um, I'm off to the Bristol Haven, uh, at a place called Newbridge. Um, I like Newbridge. Got plenty of roach in it. Uh, it's a good bag of water. I caught um, a lot of fish up in the water. I caught as well as roach. You know, get them at half depth. But I also catch little chublets and a nice, nice quality bleak as well. But uh, ninety nine percent of the matches are won with bream on the feeder. <laughs> so um, why Kevin picked me for this team match, I don't know because if I'm on bream, the chances are I'm going to miss them. <laughs> but I will put a feeder out. You never know if they're there. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, which reminds me, the um, I remember uh, uh, when I packed up fishing. When I don't know if everyone knows my story, when uh, I lost the um, the pub I had up at Shrewsbury and lost the business. I came back to Cardiff and I didn't fish for a year or two. But when I went back fishing, uh, one of the first matches I fished was um, a pole championships. On, uh, it was the South of England pole championships. It was on the Bristol Haven. And uh, I actually won it. It was seventeen pound on the pole, and um, so that held fond memories. Uh, uh, the new bridge, you know, that's why I like going back there. Um, you know, I always seem to catch a few fish there. Anyway, you know. So, <laughs> right. Um, see you and try chop them, Neil. Uh, remember when I um, right, Anthony uh, Ross? What do you think about the amount of um, tackle kit? Uh, some some of the lads have in these matches seem to keep it simple as well. Uh, can you ever compete? Do you know, um, right, I'm a great advocate on, um, uh, on it's the end, the other end of the line catches the fish. In other words, it's the angler. You know, if you've got a good angler, you can fish with any, any bit of kit at all. Obviously, you know, um, the rule comes in where, for example, when you're fishing uh, poles, you know, and they're costing huge amounts of money and because uh, they're light, you know, uh, when you're using long whips, um, when you're using uh, lighter rods, maybe on, or over a longer time. Yes, you know, uh, it comes into play. Um, and I'll see the action of the poles and the, and the rods, etc. cetera. So, um, yeah. Uh, and when it comes down to the kit, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know a few anglers who, who didn't go home if it was any any mud on it. They they want to keep it nice and clean. Well, if you see my vlogs, you see I'm you know I'm from the old school. Um, you know I'll fish with what I can. It reminds me of the time you know Ivan Max was like that, and uh, he was a great character. Ivan, I remember him fishing a, um, a float once and um, a waggler, and it wasn't quite right. So rather than you know change the um, the shot in or or changing any um, uh, uh, the float around you. All you've done is got a pair of scissors and just nipped off the top of the tip <laughs> to make it to balance it right. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It's great if you, you know, if you, you know, some of the lads, uh, one of the uh, lads now, uh, Steve Shorty, just bought one of these um, Daiwa boxes, what, 1500 quid for a, a seat, you know, for a box. Like, you know, yeah, it's great if you can afford it, but otherwise, no. <laughs> I'm not a tackle tan, I think never will be. So, you know, um, unless it was given to me, of course. <laughs> Neil, uh, how many um, uh, meters of line are do you put on your close range reel? Now, that's a good question. I sometimes I get the catching on the in the spool. Yeah, right. Now, let me tell you about that. Um, the theory was years ago when you put line on, uh, you'd only put about 50 meters on, you know, because that's all you'd need because of these shallow spools. Well, I don't particularly do that because what I do, I just judge it and I make sure that it doesn't come too far out. I try to keep as, uh, put as much line on as I can before it starts rubbing the inside the inside of the of the spool. You know what I mean? So basically, if you look at that, that needs some line on it now. But I'll try and get the, the get the line out right to the edge if I can, but not too far so it don't start rubbing on the inside. Um, so the more line you got on there, uh, the better for casting. Um, and of course, when it gets uh, when you got gets to that depth, 
it really needs more line on it because that's going to uh, that's not going to come off the screw so well. So yes, it's all about getting the right amount of line on on the actual um, on the spool. Okay, so that if that answers your question, because uh, somebody else asked me that as well about it sticking. But you uh, know, as long as you get your uh, balance of line on the spool, uh, you know, not too much and not too little, uh, then you should be okay. Another little tip. Uh, you can put silicone spray on the line, comes off easier through the rod rings and so on. Of course, the only trouble is the line will float then, which is what you want most of the times. Okay. Um, David, uh, why wasn't PEG 21 put in at Eusham? Why wasn't PEG 21? Um, right. Let me see. So we got 22, 21's about the Bridge. Now, that's a good question. They haven't put that in for a while. And that used to be a bit of a fly of that, you know, you know, because you go and uh, I think it was because a lot of snags in there. I think if I remember, uh, people complained and it's pretty close uh, to peg 20. Yeah, I think that's what it was. I think it was just the pegs are just a little bit too close. I mean, they should either put one in, they should either put 21 um, or 20. And I think uh, they, they, they just put um yeah, uh, 22 is always in. Yeah, well, 22, that's by the bridge, isn't it? That's next to the bridge. Uh, 22 is by the bridge. And I was on 23, the one below it. And then 24 is by the culvert. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so 21, which is right up on the other side of the bridge. I don't know why they don't, because it, it's got a nice long peg that, you know, it's got a long swim. Maybe the fish are under the bridge. I think they are, because I've had them there. Uh, when I, uh, a couple of years ago, I remember catching under the bridge. Um, I don't know. You have to, have, to have, have to ask the organizers about that one, I think. <laughs> Paul Jackson, uh, ah, what line do you prefer on your close range wheels? Uh, like I'm breaking strain for Budley. Right. <laughs> right. Now, um, right. I put, uh, I put diameter. I, I put diameter 16 on now, or 15 or 16, when I used to put um, diameter 12. Uh, um, you know, 1.7 and, and 2.6. But lately, Fish and Budley in particular, and a lot of other venues, um, I think uh, I think four pound, you know, diameter 16 is probably uh, the best um, line to use. Because, you, you know, you can land it. I've landed um, a 10 pound barbel on the, on the three pound line um, on the Y, you know, on the Waggler. So, I'm quite confident. It's having confidence. It depends how you play your fish, isn't it? You know, if you've got five pound or six pound on, you can yank it and, and all sorts. But no, if you, as long as you play the fish out, yeah. And, um, you know, that, funny enough, uh, Ian yesterday, he was using six pound line on his reel. And, you know, the amount of times it was kinking up, you know, and, and it wasn't laying the line on the surface of the, the river the river properly, you know. So, you know, I, 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 I you know, I don't think you, you should use a thicker line, uh, you know, any any more than four pound anyway, at least. But three pound, you know, two, six, three pounds is ideal. Okay, Paul. <laughs> uh, you didn't try run the late side. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, you know, this um, this vlog is a sort of vlog that you can you can catch up on, you know. Uh, you don't necessarily uh, have to. I mean, if, if you want to ask me a question, obviously you need to come on live. But later on, you can see it. Like uh, last one, um, or the first one last week, I'm surprised there's over a thousand people have seen it, you know. Uh, and on the night, I think it was only 30 or 40, uh, like that is tonight. So people will pick up on this later on, you know. But if, you know, if they want to ask me a question um, and they miss this, they can always leave a question uh, either on here or on my uh, Facebook page, you know. And I usually answer them anyway. Um, was that uh, Rob? Uh, uh, what do you think about the low weights in Evesham uh, for most of the season? Should that uh, stretch be fished less? <laughs> restocked? Now that is a bone of contention. That yeah, it could be restocked. Uh, I think um, Di Diane said that they were going to do it, or they have done it. I don't know. Um, but you know, the problem is. And the why is a typical example, right? If you don't fish it all year round and we just fish it for the first few months of the year, then we catch loads of fish, bags of fish. The less time a venue is fished, the better it fishes, obviously. But when you've got three matches a week, possibly four with the, you know, the juniors fishing in the evening, and then you've got 
um, if you like, uh, the pleasure anglers and practicing people are practicing, you know, it gets hammered, doesn't it? So you can understand why Evesham. Now, just outside of Pershaw, uh, where I've done a little bit of coaching, I've gone there and I, I've had double figure bags every time, you know, loads of fish there because it's not fished as much. And I think that's all it is, uh, to be honest, is the fact that Evesham, it's a fishing mecca. I mean, Look, it's it's as fair for anyone anyway, isn't it? You know, um, do we go to Evesham the bag up really? No, no, we, we go there because of the competition and for the um, the fun of meeting the other guys and fishing against each other. We all know it's going to be hard. You know you're going to have a half-decent draw, you know, because they're our favourite pegs, of course. So, yes, um, and, and it is a shame. Maybe a restocking could help, or will it? I don't know, you know. I remember when they used Bloodworm um, last year, or it was the year before, sorry, and uh, it was like a different river, wasn't it? You know, because uh, Bloodworm catches fish that, um, you know, that you, you you wouldn't normally with, with, uh, think they were there. But with the Bloodworm, the, the weights were right up. So the fish, they just, you know, if you like. Um, and that's why I think hemp becomes a good bait, because hemp is, uh, you know, um, it's not... It's put in a lot these days, but over the years it hasn't been put in a lot, and the, and the fish uh, are looking for something that they know they're not going to get hooked on. You know, um, one thing I noticed uh, this year in particular: the smaller the hemp on the hook, the more chance you got and get you getting bites. You know, all the all it makes me laugh because all the anglers say, "Oh, they're trying to find good quality big hemp." That's not the answer. The answer was the smaller hemp, really. But uh, anyway. What should I know? Because uh, the man to ask would be Ian Shepherd. He's the boy on the hemp. On um, so yes, uh, um, uh, yeah, I mean it is a shame because yeah, years ago maybe one fished this often years ago and there were be better weights there. But of course, the more times uh, a venue is fished, then you know, not so good. Okay, uh, coming back now. What's time now? All right. I, well, I, I, I've been on you an hour already, and. Um, um, I just want to just quickly go through, as I said, a few things um, about last week. Yeah, I've had a couple of good um, uh, matches, you know, as I said, on the Sunday, you know, coming fourth, uh, which is, you know, quite good. You know, out of 88 anglers, and they've all had to qualify, so I was happy with that. Wednesday, uh, again, fishing against some top anglers and coming 11th, you know, just out of the main money. It was good. And this weekend, as I said, I'm on the River Fest on um, tomorrow, uh, Saturday. So that would be interesting. And I got a little, um, uh, when I want to say it's not a method up my sleeve, but I only fished it once. And um, uh, you got three sections, of course, three sections and uh, uh, 20. And um, in each section or zone, uh, only one angler goes through. Now, um, you need to draw the middle section for Breen to, to win the match. But I don't necessarily want to draw that section because there's only about three or four pegs that, that uh, apparently they get these huge weights and the rest of the field are just playing for second. But I'd rather get one of the other zones where you're fishing for Roach or Bleak. Uh, Spud Murphy um, uh, was in my zone last uh, year and he, he had uh, 11 pound of Bleak. So that's what I got up my sleeve. I'm going to hope to try and draw... Uh, on a, a peg where there's bleak, and that's it. If not, I mean, it'd be great if I'm on the bream, I'll go for them, but uh, we shall see, see how it goes. Come back and see that vlog. Um, Sunday, I'm on the, the Bristol Avon at um, Newbridge, so that should be good. Um, sorry, this light is going down quick, isn't it? Uh, it's time, eight o'clock. Yeah, the lights are drawing in. I haven't put the lights on, I should have put the lights on, but uh, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so I saw a chap ask about uh, elderberries early on. I went uh, for a walk by uh, stream, chucked in some uh, elderberries, even the perch were eating them. Yeah, well, it is a natural food, natural thing, you know, and fish know what's good for them. They know what's protein. You know, they know what to eat. Uh, Johnny Sherbert used to be the man at Evesham years ago. Good angler. Yeah, well, he was a stick float angler, wasn't he? You know, and he, he, I'm sure even today if he was around, he'd he, he, he still compete. Because I'm sure the stick float uh, can catch as well as a pole, you know. Um, what's that? Okay. Oh, uh, Dave, Neil Smith, my teacher, was he? Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, who did the fit? Oh, the pictures behind me. Right. These pictures are actually, uh, they're, they're a master. Um, um, they, they were actually painted. These are just prints, by the way. Uh, but they were pr uh, they were printed. Um, oh. 
back in the early 19th century, they were actually painted and then they were printed. And there's a whole um, range of them from every coarse fish species and some trout as well. I'm just going to put the light on quickly. Oh, there you are. <laughs> That's a bit better. So it's talking to the tag then. Yes. Um, so, the, yeah, these... Um, in fact, uh, I think a chap named Lindsay, um, if you want to message me, I'll give you the... In fact, uh, I, I was selling the prints because uh, they're, they're not um, copyright anymore. And uh, once, you know, you can copy them. So I've got the full set. So uh, I, I, I was, you know, I was about a pound a picture, I think I was selling for, like, you know. So, uh, yeah, so if you're interested, i got the whole set. Just uh, let me know. Um, uh, Clive, if you... Are a legend. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, the thing is, in in years gone by, I used to look up to anglers like Kevin Ashurst and and um, uh, Ivan Max and uh, you know Ray Mumford and and guys like that, and that they were like my heroes, and I got to know them, you know, as, and become friends with them, you know, Bob Nudd, brilliant, you know, uh, and these these are legends. They are in my eyes, they're legends. And um, I think as as you get older, you become more knowledgeable, you become better, and, and then uh, things don't phase you as much. Obviously, look, you know, trying to compete with the youngsters is hard because they've got the eyesight, they've got the strength and mental abilities and, and so on, they should have. <laughs> um, uh, in fact, Ian asked me yesterday, he said, well, what makes you a good angler? And I, I said, well, it's hard to really, you know, put a... Um, you know, to answer that, because, you know, what makes a, a data better than anyone else or a snooker player or a golf player? You know, you, I think you, you, you either have it or you can work on it and become better and you can get taught by, obviously, people who are better than you. And um, I like that's the reason I do my coaching, by the way. You know, I was saying to Ian yesterday that I coached uh, uh, quite a few people now and a couple of a couple don't want to be mentioned by their names. Um, but I also um, coach a couple of match handlers who've been at it for years. And they're just lacking that little bit of confidence and that little bit of uh, positive attitude. And, you know, when I've taken them, they've, they've only gone on and won matches after they've been with me for a day's fishing. So, you know, as I say, we can all learn off each other. Um, whether I'm a legend, I don't know. You know, if you ask any any legend do they, you know, they don't see themselves as legends, do they, you know, they just see themselves, you know, uh, there's some great anglers now, like Mark Push, you know, he, what a, what a nice guy, you know, he's a legend, you know, in my eyes. Adrian Will is another one, I mean, uh, Adrian's a cracking angler, you know, the, um, you know, um, so yeah, there's a lot of legends around and, uh, you know, if I, if you know, if you'd like to call me a legend, then fine, otherwise I'm just one of you guys, you know what I mean, <laughs> I've just been around a bit longer perhaps, that's all. <laughs> um, right, uh, are they Morris? Hey, Morris, thanks. I'm not quite sure you meant then. Uh, <laughs> anyway, okay, um, yeah, so I'm just going to, yeah, so I'll be uh, doing two matches this weekend next Wednesday. I'm not sure yet, I'm not sure what song I am, not yet. Um, so I'm looking forward to two matches this weekend. Uh, again, I've been putting the blogs. Now, um, I hope you like the blogs, you know, because I, I'm trying to talk. Uh, I'm trying to, uh, uh, if you like, um, I, I forget a, I forgot to mention lots of things. And, and as I'm sort of, uh, if you like, uh, putting them on the software, you know, to put them on YouTube, then there are things that I, I wish I had mentioned, which I wish I had, and I forgot. But, uh, you know, I think... Over a period of time, now I'm using the microphone, I should be able to uh, get better at it, I think. And I, I'll, hopefully, I'll, 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 you know, tell you some of the thoughts the, and the reasonings why I'm doing certain things. Because I do things without even thinking sometimes, because obviously, you know, I've done it, uh, been around for a long time and, and been using methods and, and techniques, you know. Um, like, funny enough, I, I remember when... Uh, uh, when I made the videos, uh, when I first made the videos all them years ago, and uh, I, I got a hook out of out of, uh, out of the um, hook box, and I wet my finger to get it out. He said, "Well, why don't you mention that?" And I think, "Well, I, 
you know, that's logical sense, as I thought, wet your finger to get the hook out. Um, but he said, no, explain to people what you're doing. And that's something I need to start to do in on my blogs, if that makes sense. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, okay. Uh, retro, Rob, I uh, was referring to pictures. Oh, they look a bit like those by Morris. Ah, right. Um, um, no, I think the guy name was uh, Lindsay. Lindsay. Um, they were printed as put in early editions of Improve Your Cause Fishing. Uh, I had them on my wall uh, as a kid for years. Mm, I'm not sure. I'll have to look that up. Uh, um, I'll have to look that up. I'm sure the guy was Lindsay, the actual guy that that um, that painted them, because he pa he painted not only um, uh, fish, but he also done birds as well. Um, he was a famous artist um, uh, commissioned by Rhodey, I think. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, okay. All right, well, we'll have to have a look into that and uh, let you know uh, for sure. Um, uh, do you think angling should uh, be sport and not the pastime? Well, Paul, you know, the thing is, fishing, most people uh, think fishing is a relaxing pastime. You know, you go along and you smoke a pipe and, you know, Look at the scenery and it and the float and the float goes under. You know you're happy. Well, yes, there, there's that part of uh, fishing. You know, but match fishing is different because match fishing not only you're competing against the fish, you're competing against the anglers on both sides. And you know there's lots of gamesmanship that goes on and things like that. But um, which which comes back to a point that uh, one of the, uh, the viewers. I'm not sure if he's a sub subscriber. On my last blog, he made a comment to say, uh, first of all, he thought I was drinking because I said the the um, the, the way in was from one end, uh, the lower end. He said, no, he said it's always from the top, but it wasn't. Anyway, he also mentioned about the fact that I don't get my weights uh, correct when people ask me. Now, I've, I think I've mentioned it earlier on a, on a, a blog that... Um, it's some anglers like Bob Nerd and my friend, my friend Clive Roberts and a, a few anglers uh, can actually count the weight of their fish as they're catching them. You know, oh, that's four ounces, roach, next one's two ounces, that's six ounces. And in their mind, they're, they're, they're clocking up what they got. Well, I don't do that. I do something different. I, I think, well, yeah, I, I, I'd like to think, I, I, you know, if I got a pound of fish, whether it's one fish or whether it's two or three, then I think to myself, yeah, I'll have that, I'll have that. But I, I'm never really positive what I've really got because I'm, I, 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 I sort of concentrate on the fishing side of it. And I know Lee, let's just so Lee, fell out with me the other, the other week, Lee Gardner, he said to me, he said, uh, don't ever talk to him again. He said, because I underestimated my catch. And um, I said, oh, I said, I got a couple of pounds. And in fact, I weighed in nearly four pounds. <laughs> well, you know, um, it takes me back to uh, the John Smiths uh, on the Eve from Festival a few years ago. And they used to come back uh, every hour. They'd come and ask you what you caught. And I never forget this um, this one occasion. I, I I think I had two, two and a half pound or maybe three. And when he came out, he said, what have you got, Clive? I said, oh, probably got three, you know. Anyway, when he came the way, and I only had two, two and a half pound that I felt a right fool. So when people ask me, what have I caught? Or oh, any idea? I, I said, no, I, you know, I, I'll always underestimate always so when and it's a bit of a, a pleasant surprise then when i do weigh in and i've got like double what i supposed to have whether it's gamesmanship or whether it's, i'm doing it deliberately i don't know but uh anyway i thought i'd just try and clear that so you know um you know sometimes i i will know if i got one or two fish in my net i'll know what i got but when I, you're catching loads you know it's typical you know how many bleak to a pound for example you know on the why you're talking about 30 35 and other places, you're talking about 40, 45, you know. So, you know, it is very difficult. Uh, you might be one of the lucky ones, one of you. You might think to yourself, well, you know exactly what you got in the match. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always, uh, you know. If I got, like, I didn't think I had 13 pounds on Wednesday, you know. I thought, well, maybe seven or eight, but I paid in 13, you know. And I didn't want to, you know, say to anyone what I had because I just won't show. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it's a sport. Yeah. Um, there's two avenues to fishing. One is a pastime. If you enjoy it, great. Um, and if you like the um, 
if you like the sports side of it, where you're competing against the other anglers, uh, then that's great as well. Because uh, and to me, I enjoy that because it's all about um, sportsmanship, you know. And um, and I said, oh, I gotta tell you this one. There's, I don't know if you've heard this one, but I remember when I was a youngster, I had this chap from the Midlands come fish the River Tap. His name is uh, Jerry Bailey. I never get. And I was mixing some ground weight up. And it was on the driest side. Anyway, we're fishing away now, and uh, it was quite windy, and the wind was blowing down. And he kept shouting up, "Well, you got climb?" I said, "Oh, you know, I got it. You know, you catch in, yeah, yeah." Anyway, on this one occasion, I threw a little bit of ground bait, up, a ground bait in the swim, and what happened? Uh, it was quite dry, and it suddenly blew down swim. I said, "Oh, so I know." I call him, "Hey, Jerry!" And as I did, he turned around, I threw the ground bait, all the dry ground bait, flew in the air, caught him in his eyes. Uh, he was saying, "You." And he said, he said, I've heard there's some bloody tricks before. I haven't come across that one before. <laughs> so anyway, gamesmanship. <laughs> okay. Um, let's have a look. Who's this next, Thomas? Right. Uh, Clive, uh, you're a legend. Thank you. <laughs> Winning the World Championships. Uh, so, all right. Yeah, well, you know, the World Championships, it was a highlight of my career. It was fantastic. Um, a lot of people probably don't remember, but the year before I was, I was a silver medalist. I should have won that one and um i went on uh to win the world championships uh uh second day event two two other times um uh, one was when the welsh team won and i um and i had top weight then so 27 pound and then i won i had the top weight when i was in hungary and under the old conditions i've been world champion then so really i could have been four times world champion if things would have gone for me but you know they do change the rules over the years they then become over two days and so on so yeah um but uh yeah thanks for that anyway thomas uh yeah me rogers hi clive uh, do you ever go pleasure fishing if so where do you enjoy fishing do you know i i don't really um i don't go pleasure fishing it's it's matches really the only time i go pleasure fishing and i don't do it these days but years ago i may go and practice on the venue before you know just to see you know what i need to do what i can catch and so on but no um i think over the years um i i think one day i probably will have to do a bit of pleasure fishing just to enjoy the um without the pressure of, of um you know of competing i suppose but i think it, as i said to to a, a earlier viewer um uh yeah you know if, if it's pleasure fishing you like then great you know um you know a pleasure angler will always learn off a match angler because a match angler has to be on top of his game you know as well as tackle and and fish species feeding and and everything so a pleasure angler can learn a lot but we can also learn from a pleasure angler because i can remember going to gloucester canal once and there was a pleasure angler there and he was fishing a worm um against the pylons opposite and he was catching chub and uh I thought, oh, and he, he's not a match angler. He's something he just picked up. And, and of course, we started doing that in our matches then and started picking up fish. So, yeah, we all learn off each other. So, uh, as I say, yeah, pleasure fishing. Yeah, I'll do a bit of pleasure fishing when I go to Thailand. They were catching those big things. <laughs> okay. okay then. Right. <coughs> so, me, uh, yeah, I just looked at my notes now because uh, I made a couple of little notes just to, you know, just to. I don't lose track where I'm going. Um, okay, now uh, I don't know if you, uh, if anyone have seen my new subscribers um, channel. Uh, basically, um, when I make my vlogs, they they uh, obviously we got three, four, five hours, and and I try to try to cut it back a little bit. You know, um, I don't cut um, any bad bits that I just as you see is what you get. Now. Um, I, and I do speed them up as well. So, you know, if, if I'm catching or, you know, rather than watch boring stuff, you might as well speed, the, speed it up a little bit. Now, um, what I intend to do is uh, is try to monetize my uh, uh, vlogs uh, by offering a little bit extras, you know, uh, like uh, longer versions, um, a little bit behind the scenes, maybe what goes on, uh, you know, one-to-one -one chats. Um, I'm even offering... Uh, coaching days you know uh, if you subscribe um then you, you know i'll take you fishing uh, with with me one day you know so um uh, but if you look for the link on that i'll try and leave that well i start leaving that link 
um, on, on my blog. So if anyone is interested in helping me out, because at the end of the day, it costs money. You know, I'm retired. I have to work for a living. Um, you know, and uh, I, I would like to invest in a, in a camera, you know, a nice camera. Uh, I did mention the, the one I was using broke. Um, it fell in the water. Um, it's a, what was it? It's a, I can't think of the name on it now. K, oh yes, it's a K, KB camera. It's a KB something. Anyway, uh, it fell in the water. Uh, that cost me 140 quid, I remember, you know. So, uh, yeah. So it'd be nice if I do get subscribers, they'll get extra perks. And at the same time, it helps me to finance, uh, you know, maybe, uh, some cameras that so I can get some better shots and um, you know and, and some better software to edit the uh, the videos. If you notice my old videos, I just put music before and after. You know, uh, I like to do that again. Um, I did get uh, um, a bit of a I got into a little bit of bother with YouTube because uh, apparently some of the music uh, is copyright, um, uh, and I had to take it down. And if I didn't, they they would uh, you know cancel my youtube uh, so you gotta be careful what you do these days so i stopped putting music up and that was it so okay right well it's gone on for hour, hour and a bit now hope you enjoyed um you know what i've been talking about and answered some of your questions uh if there's any other questions of course you want to either message me um or leave leave uh your comments below and i can answer them um and then we can uh, hopefully uh I'll speak to you again then next week um, on a live vlog. And obviously, I'll be putting my uh, my match vlogs up uh, for you to watch. And, um, you know, if you want to discuss uh, anything that you see in the vlogs, uh, you know, methods, or, you know, you might want to ask some questions about them, then please fire away, you know, next week. Okay. Um, thank you, David. <laughs> uh, thanks for that. And hopefully we'll catch you again. And I'll go through some old other bits of tackle bits. I'll talk to you a little bit about some of my ground baits, some of the floats as well, which is, you know, because, you, you know, we can all, all, we're always learning, you know. Um, as I mentioned before, I, I was thinking of putting together some, uh, you know, how to, how to do videos, you know. Uh, and maybe I'll do that. And it comes back to then the pleasure side of it, when I could go pleasure fishing uh, and just basically go through methods and, you know, all sorts of things from casting to, to feeding, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, other, other little things that I do naturally that I don't mention on, on the video. So that's something uh, that, that uh, I might do in the future. Okay. Well, thanks for viewing in and uh, I'll see you next week, hopefully, and catch you on uh, my next vlogs. Okay. Bye for now then.